Hi, I'm Jason Jasperson. Welcome to my studio. This painting is called Christus Paradox. It's uh, named after a hymn and a concept uh, regarding the nature of Jesus. We see a lot of images in this generation. And uh, as an artist, that's a, that's a wonderful thing. And it's also a, a problem to solve because the experience of art um, is different than I, I think it ever has been. Uh, images have become so, so easy, so common. Um, so, you know, an artist in a physical medium needs to consider what is it about the physical medium that sets it apart. So this is a real painting. And, you know, what... Should there be some something about being there? I think there should be. I think it should be different than seeing it small or on a screen. So I've built in some aspects to this painting that sort of reward the viewer for being there in person. One of those is that it's large. The large scale really, um, I think you have to be there to really understand how it can kind of envelop your vision. When you're up close to it, it is possible to take up a good portion of your vision with this painting and kind of it it sort of washes over you that way. Um, it's also very textural, uh, tactile, you know, the, the paint uh, it has a topography to it, like you can feel the paint. Um, and you don't necessarily get that in on a screen. Also the gold leaf has has qualities to it that sort of move as you move. So the light bounces off of it and you see this texture and you see this reflection in a certain way uh, that, that you don't get from a still image and I, I think not even from a video. Um, so I was kind of surprised that I stumbled on this style that, that when I think about it, when I look at it, kind of has a lot of similarities to a, an art movement known as the Vienna Secession. Uh, artists such as Egon Schiele and Gustav Klimt uh, from Vienna, the early part of the 20th century, uh, kind of have some, some maybe similar aspects. You could think about this as a post-impressionist style. I think part of, part of the experience of this painting is what happens when you get close compared to what happens when you get far away. And I'm really a fan of, of art uh, doing things to your mind, to your perception. So there are optical things that are happening here. Uh, the colors lay kind of on top of each other and next to each other in a way that's similar to uh, the printing process, a four-color printing process, and this series of dots. You know, most, most magazines are printed just with four colors in different mixes next to each other. Um, so, you know, the concept here is that it's pretty much like that. These are pure colors that, from a distance, your eyes kind of mush it together. Your, your brain and your eyes, uh, your perception puts it together and makes a whole when it's really just pieces. And I think that's, that's really fascinating to play with uh, in person. Um, when you get up close, you see the big chunky brush strokes, you see all the parts. It's kind of like looking at a magazine image under a microscope or with a magnifying glass. You see all the little dots and then you back away far enough and it, it looks like a photo or an image. The origin of this image, this Christus Paradox format, uh, started kind of as an offhanded response to 
some sand animation that I had done. I was doing sand animations for a hymn project with the Lutheran Cayley Orchestra, a Celtic orchestra that makes beautiful, beautiful renditions of hymns. And I was working with them on uh, a hymn based on this, this idea of paradox, opposite things happening simultaneously. And so uh, they needed a promotional image for their event. And, and so in a matter of a couple days, I, I put together a poster image, which uh, was a simple black and white portrait that splits down the center. There's, there's light coming from both sides, and so a strong shadow right down the center of the face. And, um, and that format allows me to kind of show two things in one thing, which, which is one of the great challenges of, of being a Christian artist, uh, trying to make invisible concepts understandable and visible. So, so this same image has shown up, uh, first of all, in that poster image, that initial promotional poster, and then uh, we reused it at MVL, Minnesota Valley Lutheran High School, where uh, the art club painted a, a large enlargement of it, added some color. We used uh, an edited version uh, with some, some color as uh, a program and a poster image for that service as well. Uh, I did a sculpture based on this image um, for, no, for no real good reason except that it felt like it needed to be done and I'm moderately satisfied with that sculpture. Um, I recently did a sand animation version of this, of this Christus Paradox image and then also this painting and I, I expect that I'll be doing more paintings like this. Uh, I've had some talks with some other potential patrons. So this image uh, has, has shown up in a variety of ways. Like a lot of my projects, I, I don't really know where it's going until, until that point when I do know where it's going. And so I searched for a while trying to figure out how to paint this. Um, it, it went through different, very distinct stages uh, of me kind of thinking maybe this is it. So it had very broad, bright colors at one time. Um, and it transitioned from that into some very dark, sort of monochrome, uh, theatrical kind of strong lighting. And, uh, and I, I guess I don't remember exactly how or, or when, but, but I knew something had to happen. It was kind of losing excitement. I, I was, it wasn't doing something for me, and so I, sometimes I just have to try something drastic. And so I decided to, to let the paint be paint instead of trying to, you know, make everything like smooth and um, resolved. I really wanted, I wanted to uh, have fun with the paint. And so this, you know, what I've ended up on is something that's definitely related to Impressionism. It's related to the ideas of Impressionists or Post-Impressionists. Um, and what do I mean by that? There's, there's vibrant color that's uh, specifically placed on top of or next to complementary colors. So if you look closely, you'll see uh, some blue on top of orange, or you'll see a little orange peeking out through blue. Uh, or you might see a little bit of um, yellow on top of something that's, that's cool. And so what that does is it causes the whole thing to just feel very vibrant. Um, these, these color combinations, these opposite colors next to each other, really do some, some amazing optical kind of effects. And so I was really just having a blast. Like I would, I would put the paint down and man, I was so happy about it. Just loved it. Um, there's also gold leaf involved and I should qualify that. It's not real gold. Uh, it's an imitation gold leaf, but it has uh, similar effects. And to do that, that's a, that's a very, very thin sheet of a metallic foil. 
that's applied to an adhesive. And so, um, you know, that, uh, that kind of connects this to a very long tradition of Christian imagery. You think back to um, medieval icons that have gold leaf on them. And so I, I really like this, this sort of juxtaposition of something that feels somewhat modern with something that feels somewhat ancient. I, I like kind of being in the middle there. At the moment where I kind of decided to do something drastic, what I did is I, I kind of mapped out where are the shadows. So I looked at the whole image and, and found which areas are the dark areas. And that, that was easy to find based on my original ink drawing. So the original ink drawing is really just black and white. And um, at that stage where I, you know, I decided to go a different direction, I filled in all the dark areas with kind of a gradient of paint that, that moved from yellow through orange through red through purple through blue. And so it was the spectrum of, uh, importantly, from warm to cool. Um, that has to do with the meaning of the image. You know, we kind of have a split down the middle and two halves of Jesus' face. And I really want to kind of convey a different thing on each half. So you have warmth on, on the crown side, sort of the majesty side, and you have cool on the crown of thorns side, the suffering side. And so, you know, you, you might not even detect that gradient that I talked about, but it peeks through. And, and when you know it's there, uh, I think you might see it. If you don't know it's there, I think you might feel it. You might just have this sense that there's, there's a structure, a color structure underneath it. This is an oil painting on canvas. Um, the oil comes in tubes, I squeeze it out on my palette, and uh, sometimes I'll, I'll apply it with uh, a knife and kind of scrape it on like it's frosting or, or peanut butter. Um, sometimes after that paint dries, you know, it, if it gets built up too strong or, or I kind of want to revise, um, I'll, I'll scrape that paint back, I'll kind of like smooth out the canvas. Uh, and then, you know, in the end, I, I ended up brushing on paint with uh, kind of a thick, thick application with a paintbrush. Uh, using a palette knife is actually somewhat an economic decision. It, uh, it allows me to really maximize how, how much canvas I can cover with that same amount of paint. Um, you, get, you get kind of this broad sort of plow that pushes the paint across the canvas. Uh, you can push that paint quite a ways because you're really, um, you're really making contact with the canvas and just pushing the paint forward. It kind of squeezes it all forward. So you can get a lot of coverage with a, a knife, move that paint and, and kind of maximize how far it goes. Um, but uh, it results in a different kind of surface. Uh, it's a little bit like frosting or, or peanut butter. Um, when you use a paintbrush, you know, all of this kind of depends on, on the consistency of the paint, too. I can make the paint diluted or take it straight from the tube. Um, so a paintbrush, you know, kind of uh, leaves, leaves some more paint on the surface and um, just sort of deposits it there, you know, leaves like a little lemon meringue uh, food analogy, little bits of paint there. So in this case, uh, I'm really kind of uh, using the paint pretty thick in the end, and uh, I'm interested in that buildup, that kind of almost landscape of the paint surface.
So the, the patron, our savior Lutheran in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, approached me to do this painting as a 50th anniversary for their congregation. And um, they had seen the Christus Paradox image before and, and wanted, wanted to work with that image, but asked for it as an oil painting which I had never done before with that image. And that presented a particular challenge because I initially created it as an ink image. And each medium kind of has different requirements or different strengths and limitations. The original ink image is, is what we would call a graphic image. It's, it's very strong uh, and contrasty. It's high contrast. and. Um, you know, oil paint is capable of, of very nuanced color shifts. Oil paint is capable of uh, just about anything. It can be graphic. It can, it can look like an ink high contrast image. But when I use a medium, I want to kind of take advantage of its strengths. I want to really sort of push what it does well. And, and with oil paint, it does so many things well. So, so I was presented with a lot of options, a lot of choices. Um, you know, when, when you say you want an oil painting, that, that could mean Claude Monet, and that could mean Pablo Picasso, and that could mean Caravaggio. So you've got, um, you've got a broad range of, of what oil painting can mean. And so I, I sort of, you know, cycled through some different options as I was painting this, trying them on in a way. Um, and, and decided on this very, what I would call painterly approach. It's a painting that announces that it's made of paint. It doesn't pretend to be a photograph. Um, it doesn't hide the paint. It's, it's very bold about what it's made of. There's a particular challenge with trying to represent Jesus. Uh, it's been done many, many, many times. And, and anything that's, that's done many times means that you've got some good and you've got some bad and you've got some middle. And, um, you know, you, you've got all kinds of concerns to try to navigate when you're representing Jesus. You've got uh, you know, the physical sort of build. You've got ethnicity to think about. You've got sort of his demeanor. Over the years, centuries, there have been sort of very, very different um, friendly or unfriendly looking Jesus. Um, so part of, part of why I'm so happy with this painting style, too, is that it's, it's somewhat obscure. It doesn't answer all those questions, and it leaves room for interpretation. I really, I'm, I'm satisfied, I'm happy that uh, the shadow right down the middle of the face, all the way back to the ink drawing, uh, kind of ob obscures some of the identifying features. And, uh, and I'm happy that the, the paint in this painting is a little loose and everything, you know, is just sort of floating or woven together, but, but doesn't necessarily lock into a, a, a strong, complete image. Um, so, so what you can think is that the material and the method contribute to the meaning. The way that this is painted is part of what it means. It's part of the message. That we don't get to know everything, but we do know that, that God is glorious and loving and, um, and vibrant and surprising. 
and that people see different things and people experience uh, different things in different ways. And so, you know, I'm, I'm very satisfied with the, uh, the way that the medium becomes part of the message. I had all kinds of choices to consider in this painting. Um, you know, the idea of sunlight and sort of overcast colors, warm and cool colors, could be flipped and you could tell the story that way. Um, you know, I, th I think about the incarnation of, of God on earth, Jesus, and, um, you know, in some ways that's, that's the clearest vision we have of him, and yet it, it's, it's the sort of mask that he put on, the veiled glory, uh, the humility. So, you know, I, I think hard about these things, and um, the reality is that there's a, there's a thousand ways, a thousand right ways to do any work of art. You know, it could, it could have turned out differently and, and well in a different way. appreciate the relationship I've had with this, uh, this commissioning body, with the patrons. Um, they've, they've really trusted me to, to do what I see fit with the painting. Um, first of all, they expressed trust in me by, by approaching me and then um, kind of allowing me to, to make decisions as, as an artist, as a professional. I really appreciate that trust from them uh, because I think I think together we came up with with something that maybe we we didn't know we could do I'm really happy with the outcome um, it, to me it's it's really important that people do commission art because in some ways that that's a partnership that's necessary Artists need people to ask and to pay for their time and materials. And so, you know, there, there's, there's something heroic about taking that risk on an artist. It's a maybe a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for someone to be involved with the creation of an original work of art. The congregation has a spot ready for this painting. They have a recessed area in the wall that has light pointed at it, and um, it's, it's in the entryway, sort of a, the mingling narthex area of the church where people kind of come in and, and uh, talk to each other, and before and after services, uh, there's kind of a social aspect to the space. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of fascinated by that idea that you know, somebody, somebody might forget it's there and then be surprised by it. Um, and you'll see it from a doorway, you know, from a distance, and then you'll kind of walk past it or walk up to it and, and see it differently. And, and you'll have, um, it'll sort of dwell with the congregation. I really like that idea that there can be this relationship with a lot of people over a long time. I think you have to realize that that this is the only the only one. It doesn't come from a factory. Uh, it can't be replicated in an exact fashion. Um, so there's there's something significant about the real thing, the one and only. Uh, that that might be lost on us to some degree when uh, we consume content that's so easily distributed and, and, um, and manufactured in a digital way, um, it's, a, it's a different kind of experience uh, to see something in, in person. And I think also there's something to the idea that 
uh, what an artist makes lasts for generations. That, that's something to really consider. Um, what does it mean that you can look at the same painting or sculpture or building that your great-great-grandparents looked at? What does that mean? I think, I think uh, there's power to that that grows with time. That's assuming that the work is good. You know, if, if the work isn't, isn't that good, I, I think maybe it won't survive till great-great-grandpa uh, or great-great-grandchildren see it. Uh, and that's just a natural process. And that, that's kind of the challenge of every artist to not only please the present, but please the future or be relevant for the future.